Yeah, so a question that a patron asked, uh, and I think I know how I would answer this, but I'm curious about how you would, would it was, okay, so a, a different argument that somebody could have made uh, against, you know, voting for the Democrats the last election, uh, you know, wouldn't be because, you know, they think that we're, you know, on the verge of storming the, you know, whatever the American equivalent is the best deal the best right deal, now, yeah. uh, you know, but uh, that they, but that this is something because voting is one of the few times uh, when we get to exercise any quarter sort of like leverage over people that they need our votes, so they have to accommodate us somehow. So that uh, that if the left people had supported Bernie, you know, had like been more willing to just uh, withhold uh, their votes, you know, their votes for Biden, then you know we could have like effectively used that to to exercise some sort of leverage and get more of the things that we want politically. Well, I guess I have a couple a couple of issues with that. One is that in the 2020 election, like mm -hmm. I was genuinely not. I mean. I still am genuinely not certain that had Trump won this election, I'm not sure there was going to be a 2024 election. And so I guess to, to me, like part of what was at stake in this election last month was like the democratic institution itself, itself, you know, like Trump has basically just openly disdained democracy, said that he, you know, he, well, I guess he'll, he'll, he sort of has an excuse, which is that, oh, the Democrats are going to steal the election. And then when the Democrats won, he said, oh, the Democrats stole the election, right? And, but to me, like, it's, I mean, it's obvious, right, that this is, this is his way of stealing the election, right? Or, or, or of just not stealing it, actually, of just discounting it, right? And I feel that if he's willing to do that, why wouldn't he be willing? I don't know. It, it was, just, I was just, I just felt that like it's a much better situation to be kind of trying to influence the government if Biden's in charge than if Trump is. Like it's it's a much more, um, you know, at least you have like this this guarantee that there's going to be another election. Um, okay. I guess the other the other issue is like I feel that with Biden with with Bernie losing the primaries, yeah. like I feel like the the kind of leftist you know, far left progressive that they already had kind of been discounted by the Democrat. I, I don't know. I just, I just feel like it's not a big enough group to exert that kind of pressure. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. You know, that what they, I mean, I think that that second point, I mean, like, I, I think I might've been more optimistic. Uh, you know, I think it was definitely more optimistic about Trump, um, you know, leaving office. I mean, I, I, I mean, I kind of think he's blustering and, you know, and, and, and it's probably and like everything else Trump does is probably some kind of fundraising grift. Uh, but, uh, but, but certainly this, this point about like the pool of people that you're realistically talking about here, right? Like, like, I think like, uh, you know, it was a lot less this time, but like, you know, a million people maybe, I guess, voted for, uh, for, for Jill Stein in 2016. And, you know, mm -hmm. and like, what's, you know, I always thought, okay, what's the total pool of people that we're talking about here, you know, that are like, that are like really considering this, you know, like, okay, do, you know, that who would consider not voting for Biden for left-wing reasons. And, and it seemed like, um, you know, it seemed like if everybody in that pool had not done that, right, like then, then I'm, I'm not, um, I don't know. I mean, like, it, it, it seems like there are, you know, it's a big country. There are lots of different places to draw votes from, you know, like, I, I, I have a really easy time imagining the Democrats just saying, oh, we should, you know, I guess we didn't try hard enough to get like suburban moderate Republicans. We'll do more of that next time, you know, rather right. than saying, you know, oh, I guess we really need to appeal to, uh, you know, to, to leftists, uh, you know, like the ones that we beat in the primary. And I, I, I have a hard time you know, seeing what their, um, you know, seeing what their incentive, you know, to, to do that is. I mean, I guess it's a little bit like the revolution thing that uh, I, I think it would be beautiful if there was, you know, a uh, electorally viable party besides the Democrats and the Republicans, but I, I don't know that you can just wheel that into existence. You know, I, I think that, I think that when that has happened in the past, you know, like the Republicans coming about in the 19th century, it seemed like that had to come from like the collapse of an existing party and not just, you know, a, you know, well, not just whatever the 1850s equivalent of was of you know of very online people just you know just deciding not to uh, not to vote for the Whigs. Yeah, I think that something would have to kind of would have, I I agree that would have to precipitate the collapse of the Democratic Party, and I think the Republican Party is a lot closer to collapse than the Democrats. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I wonder, right? Like, is, uh, I, I mean, it, it seems like after you've, after you've had Trump, you know, like, I mean, sometimes it just seems like, okay, whatever, things will just go on. They'll just adjust to the, the new realities. But it also seemed like there are all these people who got into it for Trump, especially this time. Like yeah. they, like he had, um, you know, like, like we actually had like crazy turnout. It was just like even higher on, on the democratic side, you know, so, so Biden won, but like uh, there were 70 million people uh, who, yeah. who voted for Trump. That's way more than you usually vote for, you know, Republican. And it, it sort of seems like, you know, once you've had like the, the good, like, you know, once you've had the good stuff, you've had the pure uncut Trump, <laughs> you know, like, are you really going to settle for Marco Rubio or whatever? It's hard to <laughs> imagine. It's hard to imagine them putting in a Mitt Romney type figure at this point, right? Like they've gone too far. I don't think they can go back. Um, I don't know. I don't know what they'll try to do. It, it's because I, I agree that like, so much of the Republican politics, you know, before Trump was basically just a kind of softer, respectable way of playing, you know, I mean, I mean, people, people like McCain or Mitt Romney, like, these are people who are primarily like pro, you know, big business, basically, right. like, it's, it was, it was, it's about their, their capitalists, right. And, but they were, they, they would kind of softly use the kind of dog whistles of race and masculinity that Trump uh, uses a foghorn, right? right? And I think that more people actually will go along with a kind of pro-white, like almost like proto-white nationalist kind of movement than will go along with a pro, uh, you know, corporations are people, my friend, like, <laughs> right. like um, you know, billionaire movement, you know? Um, so, that's it's it's hard to imagine the Republicans trying to go back to that. I, I guess one one possibility is that they run someone like um, Tucker Carlson, right? right? Someone who says, "Oh, this is actually the party of the working class now, and we're defending America from Black Lives Matter, from Antifa, from from you know from the cultural Marxists or whatever." And like, and and that's kind of a, what I'm guessing is going to happen, which is pretty terrifying because I guess I feel like everyone on the left right now is afraid that we're gonna have some authoritarian fascist who like Trump, but much more competent and not just a grifter. Right. Yeah, I mean, Tucker, I mean, like, like in some ways that's incredibly frustrating uh, because, you know, these people like like Tucker Carlson who say that, you know, that you'd be the party of the working class. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the second you start to scratch under the surface, it's like, okay, well, look, do they, you know, do they support giving everybody health care? Do they even support raising the minimum wage? Of course not. They don't support any of that yeah. stuff. It's, yeah. it's just cultural signifying, you know, that they that that they're on team, you know, well, white working class. Uh, but unfortunately, like, you know, cultural signifying is a lot of how people actually decide to, to do these things. I mean, it seems like, you know, maybe part of the problem, like, you know, like one of the reasons, uh, you know, that Bernie lost, for example, uh, is that even though you know there was there were exit polls showing all these states that you know that uh, exit polls uh, there were exit polls showing that all these states that uh, that Biden uh, that Biden won uh, in the uh, in the primaries that you know most people supported you know Medicare you know most Democratic voters supported Medicare for all for example and I'm, I'm sure a lot of that was was about Trump you know that people were so desperate to get him out and they thought that Biden was a safer bet but it also seems like some of it might just be that a lot of people don't really take seriously the idea that um, you know that any of this stuff is is, is going to happen, right? You know that like that just that just participating in politics is a way that you can bring about things that are actually going to make a real material difference in your life. You know they're they're like very well trained to think that yeah okay people say it will you know during during yeah. elections, but then it really won't, right? So then we're we're kind of back to at least like giving me the right, you know, like signaling in the right way culturally. And, yeah. it, and at least you can, it, at least it, you can really show the bad people, right? You're back to like punishing the bad people that, you know, that if, if nothing else, I mean, the Trump, um, you know, I mean, the most honest Trump yard signs that I've seen are the, you know, to before the election are the ones that said cry more libs, you know, yeah. on them. Cause like, that's really the appeal of Trump that he, that he's, he's going to, He's going to make 
all of your political enemies really, really, really mad by his presence. And Despite so- voting, yeah, it's very strong. Um, you know, it's it's like some of these people seem not to actually, they don't actually believe anything he says. I, I mean, there was a, I guess, where did I read it? It was an interview with um, SEAL Team 6, the guy who killed Osama bin Laden, who was a Trump supporter. And I guess what he said, he was like, uh, about Trump, you know, tweeting outrageous thing is, oh, that's just Trump being Trump, you know, it, you know, he's just doing that to, 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 to rile up the libs, like to, to, to piss them off. And, and they, they love that. They love that he does it. And it's like, so they know that this man who lives in a golden apartment is not like a man of the people. They, they kind of know that he's not even going to, I don't think these people actually think he's going to bring back steel and bring back manufacturing and bring back coal. Like at this point, they must know he's not doing that. Uh, no one seems to really care whether the wall is built or not or whether it works. Uh, so it's like, what do they want? Well, they, they like that he pisses off the people they don't like. They like that the sn- sn- snobs and CNN who don't represent them hate him, um, that he's not politically correct or whatever. I don't know. It's, it's like, yeah, it is a, uh, a, a vindictive, petty, <laughs> spiteful. Yeah. Well, yeah. if you won't listen to me, then burn it down. I don't want to play your, you know, I, I don't know. It's, 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 it's hard for, it's a little bit hard for me to imagine uh, voting this for this reason, but yeah, no, fair enough. Uh, so, uh, so I, I guess, uh, so I, I guess that does maybe you know bring us uh, back to what we we're to, you know starting to talk about earlier because I think that maybe the same like lack of belief, you know, that like this this kind of like deep like what you know Mark Fisher called you know capitalist realism that you know which is is, is not which is a very different thing from like celebrating the status quo or thinking it's awesome, but it's just yeah. thinking that it's, it's inevitable. It's just like the weather, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, I, I think that like, it, I think it's something that no matter what people think ideologically, it kind of seeps into all of us. And, yeah. uh, and I, I wonder too, you know, when, when you start thinking about like the things that are kind of pathological uh, about parts of the left right now, if that is a big part of what causes it, that it, that people, um, you know, again, if you're not really confident that you know that we're you know we're going to win or, or or you know like that that we're going to actually like accomplish much uh, in in the real world, you know, because you're just so, I mean, you know, God, I mean, if you've got any sort of political position to the left of liberalism, um, you know, you're just so used to to losing all the time, right? You know, that's that's the that's just the normal state of things. And so if you can't, um, you know, if you can't win, you can at least like show people how committed you are and you can show yourself how committed you are. And uh, you can at least have the satisfaction of going after people who are supposed to be on your side, but, uh, but you think like really aren't or like really don't show adequate commitment or are too friendly to, you know, people who are, en- you know, who are enemies of yours and you can get some of that kind of emotional satisfaction uh, that way, which is the only way that I know how to make sense of, um, of for example, uh, you know, what, um, you know, what, what happened, um, you know, with you um, last year, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, ask you to go through the whole thing. I'm sure you're sick of it at this point, but uh, the, uh, but uh, a lot of people online decided uh, that, uh, that you were uh, either like a self-hating transphobe or maybe that like you, you, you were really like against like non-binary trans people or, or, or something like that. Uh, uh, and even though, um, even though, I mean, like all, you know, your videos, I mean, I guess not the really old ones, but you know, but like a, but you know, a whole ton of them, right. Are, are right there on YouTube for anybody to see. And so, you know, you'd think that somebody is saying, okay, I wonder what Natalie thinks about X, right? I wonder what Natalie thinks about, you know, whether non-binary gender identities are real things, they can go look at your videos about them. So, I mean, what, um, I, I guess you can speak to any part, you know, to, to, to any part of, of that that you want to, but I mean, it's, it's, it's just, I, I think that if you're taking it all on the level that like that people, you know, the people are just like, you know, confused about what your positions are or other people who end up, you know, being sort of piled on in this way, they're just confused about what their positions are. It's really hard to make sense of. Yeah, I think that, uh, I guess I want to say that I don't, 
talk about canceling because I'm trying to avoid criticism. Like, yes, I have made mistakes and I have done and have said things that are kind of like off and problematic, but, but I guess where it becomes, you know, a real problem is when people kind of seize on those things and they put them forward as evidence that actually secretly you're a really horrible person and you're, and you're trying to destroy trans people and all the things that you say in public, that's just a mask. That's just you pretending to like trans people for profit, like question mark, like, I, I, you know, despite, despite the fact that actually much more profit is to be had in doing the opposite. Um, but I, I, I guess I think that I agree with what you're saying where people, a lot of people feel very powerless and they want to storm the best deal. They want to get the bad guys, but the best deal is hard. It's very well fortified and uh, they don't have any guns. So you can get you get a YouTuber, you know, that'll do. Like, like it's, it's about getting a, a feeling of power of bringing someone down, you know? And I think that that is part of the thrill of why people do this. Like there's a lot of rage that kind of has no outlet, a lot of, daily injustice that never seem where it seems like no one is ever held to account um you know but sometimes you can you, there's you know when someone is not big enough that there's sort of an arm's reach you actually can kind of like get them in some way and i think that that what that happens often like with uh, trashing people within leftist communities um there's a lot of like the hate that sort of should be maybe directed at like, I don't know, the billionaire class or like uh, D Donald Trump or whoever ends up finding a, a, a sort of is transferred to a, a lower target, um, you know, like a leftist who, I don't know, just tweeted something dumb seven years ago or whatever it is, right? Like, it's, it becomes, I mean, there, there's, there's that element of it. I think the, the transfer of frustrations. And then there's also, I think a kind of, um, well, it's, it's sort of a failure to abolish the police within, right? Like we sort of learn from um, uh, the, the way that power exercises itself in our world. And then we kind of reiterate those forms of power and domination. Uh, in our own communities without necessarily being super reflective about it. Uh, you know, I guess the guillotine is a great metaphor for that actually because, uh, I, I, you know, the, the monarchy in France, like corporal punishment and execution was like, that was how the kings maintained power was with these big displays of, of torture and, and execution of tra traitors, right? Um, like the, the one that Foucault talks about in, in Discipline and Punish, um, Damien, who tried to kill Louis the Fourteenth, and was, you know, flesh torn off his body in public in the public square with hot pincers or whatever. Like, uh, well, then you know, I think it was Robespierre was initially he was anti-capital punishment, but by the time the revolution came around, suddenly we're executing people, you know, eight hundred a month or whatever. And I think that uh, the desire to punish, you know, even as we, the the desire to kind of I don't know, the sort of surveillance over each other mm. and the the kind of reporting of uh, of crimes and, uh, you know, desire to, to, to punish. And it is it just seems to kind of come, it, I've heard people argue that it comes from a sort of internalized, uh, it's like internalizing the police state or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, like, I, I think that there's there's a weird tension between two things that people say about this, which are one is what you alluded to at the beginning of that mm -hmm. answer, which is, oh, uh, people who complain about canceling just don't like being criticized. You know, they think they should be immune from criticism. Uh, and and the other is um, that this is this is a, this is actually like really important because you know what you're actually talking about is is accountability. You're holding people accountable. Mm -hmm. And, and I always wondered how those two fit together because it seems like if we really were just talking about criticism, you know, criticizing somebody doesn't really hold them accountable. You know, that's, that's, no. that's not, that's not accountability. That's just like, you know, telling them why, you know, where you think they got it wrong and then they can tell you what they think. And, you know, like that's, that's not really a punishment, uh, you know, but, but if you, if you think, oh, this is great, we're holding people accountable, that seems to acknowledge that there's a difference between criticism you know, which is like what somebody might do if like they made a video where they like argued against something that you say 
in one of your videos. That's right. criticism. Yeah. Uh, th there's a difference between criticism and this kind of like mass pile on of like a hundred strangers yelling at you at the same time, you know, which I think is something that just like realistically, psychologically, like, like I, I, I don't think most of us are built for just shrugging that off. No. Yeah. It's, it's, well, there's a lot of problems that kind of compound against uh, with each other. Like there's people who have like valid criticisms or who want some kind of acknowledgement from you of the mistakes that you've made. Uh, that's totally fine. But the thing is that it exists in this digital space where there's also, you know, a lot of people who are just being straight up abusive and there's people who are calling for your exile, d demanding your friends to, to disown you. And it sort of builds as the momentum. Um, it, it, I don't know, it, it's, it's hard to, to, to make general statements about this sometimes because I think different case, you know, different cases have people are, they happen for different reason and they work right. in different ways. Um, mm -hmm. I think in my case, like one thing that that's frustrating to me is that there's a lot of people, maybe uh, several hundred people who are just kind of almost obsessively angry about my existence. And it's, it's hard exactly to say why, except that I think it comes from, uh, I mean, I think in my case, there's, there's particular reasons why people are, are very resentful of me. Uh, a lot of trans people feel very powerless, very unheard, and they, see me as someone who like cis people listen to and who has uh you know who has a level of acceptance that's not available to most trans people and so that's frustrating to begin i mean because of like the pettier impulses and human nature which let's just be honest like they're gonna happen sure. but also i think that, you know that gets they're, they're it, gonna happen but it's a matter of degree maybe you can't abolish the police within but you can at least defund it right you can defund yeah exactly and I think that then that, that kind of background resentment gets really exacerbated when I do something they don't like or say something they think is bad or wrong. Cause it's like, not only do I unfairly you know, have all this stuff that they want and can't have, but also I'm using that position to misrepresent them or to, you know what I mean? It's, so I think that that is sort of part of what's going on here. It's, it's I think a reason why someone who is like not trans in my position probably wouldn't have this type of devoted hate following. Um, but I also think that, you know, obviously like I'm not the only one who like literally anyone who is involved in like media these days, journalism, any kind of activism is aware of this kind of problem and is kind of lives in some level of fear of having a mob come after you online. Yeah, and, and again, I mean, this is something I think it's like very easy for people to say, oh, you know, whatever, log off, what do you care, right? You know, it's, it's not gonna, it's not gonna hurt you. But then, then the question is like, okay, but one, is that really what we would say in, in any other situation, right? Like, like if, yeah. if, a, you know, if 100 people are, are, you know, we're saying, you know, uh, you know, horrifically, you know, sexist things to a woman online, you know, would, would any- uh, Just log off, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I don't think we'd be, right. Yeah, we don't accept that in those conditions. And the reality is like a lot of us, like, come on, like we all know that most of us are way too online. We kind of work online, we live online. There's now a pandemic, so we cannot do anything but I be know. online. And so it's like, log, just log off, like just log out of the public forum, basically. Um, go away, disappear. Like that's, you know, not, not a great option. I also think that, um, I mean, I, I do think there's, there's, there's things you can, like people who are just being abusive online, like everyone has to deal with that no matter what, to some extent. And, you know, you know, so like, they're, they're saying this as if you aren't aware that you can, you can block people as if you don't do that already all the time. But right. it's, uh, you know, I, I've had an issue where, where anytime, like someone will say like, they're, I don't know, they're, they're having me on their podcast, for example, on Twitter. And then like someone resp will respond to that being like, oh, ContraPoints is a transphobic turf, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, it's, it's, it's just harder to not constantly run into it. And the reality is that the human brain has never in, in the history of our species had to deal with criticism on this volume. 